Okay. <laughs> well, thanks for coming. Um, my name is David Halevi, and uh, I'm a is American Israeli uh, citizen. Um, was born in the Promised Land, which is West Texas. If you guys didn't know that. Um, <laughs> Good thing Josh is here, so we can laugh at all our jokes. <laughs> he knows all our jokes, and he's going to laugh at all of them. And he still laughs. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, Aaron and Marshall and I uh, started doing ministry together a long, long time ago, and we started a podcast together uh, about seven years ago, maybe, yeah, roughly. Yeah. Um, and so he's going to introduce himself. Um, but... Uh, you know, who are we, who are these guys? Uh, and actually you're going to go first with this stuff. Yeah. If you want to introduce yourself. Yeah. So, um, I can use this mic. Yeah, you can use that. Yeah. So my, uh, well, as David said, uh, my name is Aaron Marshall and, uh, grew up in, uh, Virginia. Cause we were talking about, yeah, Southwest Virginia, uh, was a Virginia tech Hokie. Uh, that's my family's still there. In fact, my dad, um, you know, my, my parents are great parents. Uh, my dad's um, not a, a believer, but, you know, for many people in Southwest Virginia, Virginia Tech athletics is uh, their religion, right? And so we worshiped at the throne of Lane Stadium on Saturdays with uh, Virginia Tech athletics. But uh, by God's grace, uh, married uh, my beautiful wife, Jess. We have five kids. And we were, um, so just two, two minutes on my story. I, I went to law school in Texas. I was... Uh, uh, super liberal, and uh, I was I, I was saved in college, but I was very I was undiscipled, and um, you know, kind of was was a prodigal for 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 a long time. But my 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 twenties were a pretty lost decade, and uh, I was actually a lawyer in North Carolina practicing law. I was actually working for an atheist. Uh, we were joking last night. An atheist attorney. Uh, he was of the of the view God doesn't exist, and I hate him. You know, kind of that uh, Christopher Hitchens type uh, guy. And and so I was actually being very influenced by him. I was actually even reading some atheist literature. And, uh, but the reality was it was just sin in my life. My life was a disaster. And out of the um, you know, just trash heap of a life, uh, you know, discovered uh, by God's grace apologetics and got some answers to questions that I had had my entire life. Uh, apologetics just means to give a defense. So, so answers, you know, evidence for the Christian faith. And when I discovered that, I was like, this is what I want to do. I, I want to go back and work with college students because I got such bad answers or no answers when I was in college. And I know my life was a debacle because of that. And so, you know, my, my precious wife, you know, she signed up for a very different life. We were going to, you know, live the life of a lawyer. And uh, now, she, we're, now we're supported missionaries. And uh, so we moved to Wilmington, North Carolina, and we were uh, started a ministry there called Ratio Christi. Uh, Ratio Christi is, uh, it's, it's Latin for the reason of Christ, but we're on about 150 campuses nationwide. We just started one of the chapters. The ministry was actually birthed out of the seminary that I went to. And so this is a, a, our chapter in um, Utah, but we just talk about the evidence for Christianity. And we were in Wilmington for seven years, no intention whatsoever of leaving. Uh, but the president of our ministry, his name's Corey Miller, he grew up in Utah and he grew up Latter-day Saint. And so he had obviously a heart for Utah. And so in 2019, uh, I went out with him, 2018, I went out with him to, uh, we were trying to get some interest for starting a Rosh Christi chapter in Utah. And God just broke our heart for the area and went back home and told my wife we should move to Utah. She said, no way. Why would we ever move to Utah? And after some fighting and some prayers, we decided to go for one year, which became two years and three years. And so uh, now we're there for the rest of our lives. We've, we've burned the bridges. And so one of the, so you see in the top, um, the top left there, that's Utah Valley University. Um, 45,000 students in the heart of Utah County. Uh, Utah is the least evangelical state in the country. Most people don't know that because you know it's the heart of Latter-day Saints or Mormons and we'll talk more about that throughout the day uh, but Utah Valley University about 45,000 students and maybe 150 Christians maybe 200 Christians there total so it's a mission field and so we moved to Utah County last summer bought a house down there, started a Rosh Christi chapter at Utah Valley University. And our goal is that um, we want to start. So the bottom uh, left corner here is a, is a ministry in Utah called the Solid Rock Cafe. And it's a, a coffee shop study center uh, in this little town called Ephraim. I know it's he gets mad when I say that. It's not a Ephraim, but it's they, they've, they've co-opted every, every uh, biblical term and kind of perverted it. Uh, but so, uh, but it's in Ephraim, Utah, and uh, it's a coffee shop. And you're like, why would you, why would you start a coffee shop to reach 
LDS because they're not allowed to drink coffee. The word of wisdom, uh, the doctrine, Dean, doctrine and covenant says don't do that. But which, what we're looking for, and we'll talk about that today, is we're looking for those that want to have conversations. We're looking for those that are ready to have the conversation and the coffee shop kind of draws them out. Uh, we've also developed these mission trips. Um, so we actually, Josh and Caitlin are here. We we bring people to Utah uh, for a, a, an intense week. I think they've been on four of our mission, uh, four of our mission trips, three. And uh, so it's a week of apologetics evangelism. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today it doesn't have to be college students. It can be anybody. Um, and it's, it's both to challenge you to know what you believe and why you believe it, because you're going to get into lots of conversations with people who profess to be Christians, but aren't. They're members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And then Mormons, uh, you know, broadly, we also talk to some polygamists. We talk to, we talk to anybody. Um, but also most, what we've discovered is I think most evangelicals are more Mormon in the way they think about God and when they think about religion and when they think they even think about the gospel. And so a lot of it is just to challenge ourselves, do we really believe the one true gospel? And so then we were able to, uh, with David to start doing, we did the first uh, trip to Israel, let him talk about that um, this summer and you know, just super excited about that. But uh, the, you know, maybe the last thing is our goal, um, you know, we really do believe the, the local church is the hope of the world. So this um, in the upper left corner or the upper uh, right corner there is a, a town called Vineyard. Uh, 10 years ago, there's about 150 people that lived there. Now there's about 17,000. Uh, it's right outside. Uh, it's in Orem, which is right beside Provo, which is the home of Brigham Young University. So between Brigham Young with 35,000 college students and UVU, which is right across the interstate, 45,000, we've got you know, 80 plus thousand college students plus, you know, all of the, the families. Uh, the average age of a person in Vineyard is 10 because it's all uh, young families. So, you know, if you know LDS, very, very big families. So it's young families with lots of kids. And um, so this area is exploding. And by God's grace, we're hoping to plant a, a church there uh, this time next year. So hopefully uh, September of next year, the church we're going to now is a church called Mosaic Church. That's here, uh, the, the, the left. That's uh, where we're, we're going now, kind of our sending church. And we're, the goal is that they would want to, we want to plant church all over Utah County. Uh, Utah County, 0.3 to 0.5% even evangelical Christian. Um, so statistically, there's more Christians in, you know, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, than there are in Utah County, uh, Utah. And so um, hopefully by God's grace, our ministry would, we'd have a study center that would house our church. Uh, and then we'd have the ministry at the university. And, um, you know, then we'll, then we'll spend the rest of our life there proclaiming the gospel in, uh, you know, the least evangelical state in the country. So that is me. And that's a little about me. And I'll pass it off to David. Okay. So yeah, my name is David Halevi. Um, my family background is we're Jewish. And so, um, but my father, um, Gershon became a follower of Jesus, Yeshua. And I use Yeshua, we just his Hebrew name. So whenever I say Yeshua that I'm talking about Jesus, so you guys know. Um, so my dad actually funny, uh, amazing story, but he became a believer going actually to Brigham Young University in Hawaii. And that's a story in of itself, which I you know can't go into. But amazing story was not Mormon, just a Jewish kid in Hawaii, surfing, sailing, having a good time, but miserable. And then the Lord got him, and and uh, things changed. So I uh, became a believer, um, and then uh, we have uh, you know um, been in ministry by vocationally for a long time, and then eventually started uh, the ministry that we have now, which is called Builders of Israel. And we are a gospel ministry to the Jewish people, specifically Israelis. And then when I say Israelis, I mean Jewish Israeli, Arab Israeli, uh, you know, the whole gamut of uh, population there. Um, but the, you know, the reality is, is that in Israel, about 0.01%, even maybe less than that, um, of the Israeli population is a believer, is, uh, you know, follows Yeshua as the Messiah. And uh, it's kind of ironic and tragic that uh, the Jewish people are so neglected. Um, but as you're going to see later this afternoon, you know, there's a reason for that. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's many reasons for the hostility uh, against the gospel by the Jewish people, you know, my fellow relatives. But obviously, you know, now I'm a, <laughs> a believer, I'm a follower of, of Jesus. And uh, so our ministry is Builders of Israel. And um, again, we're evangelism discipleship. We do apologetics and evangelism training. Uh, and, and Aaron has been a crucial you know, part of, of that just over the years and, and helping me 
Um, and then exegetical biblical teaching from a historical Jewish perspective is also a big deal. You know, there's a, a huge, you guys are in a, a, a good congregation here with uh, Dane as your pastor and just the background that he has and, and the heart that he has for the Jewish people and the sensitivity he has knowing that um, the Bible is Israel centric, it's Jewish centric. And so, um, you know, those of you in this congregation are really blessed to be um, under that um, tutelage. But uh, so this is one of the groups that we help train um, uh, in Israel. Um, they're from South Africa. So they actually, this is actually a, a global mission group where they go around the world um, uh, preaching the gospel for a whole year. And they spent about um, a week and a half in Israel. We were able to train them in Jewish, Jewish evangelism. Here's another South African group that we had that come, came through that we train in Jewish evangelism. And then we have other groups throughout the year that come through from Norway, from Germany, from Poland, that we spend time with one or two days uh, training them how to speak to Israelis, how to speak to Jewish people, uh, like we're going to do with you guys today. Um, and again, you know, um, Aaron leads um, the missions trip to Utah. And uh, these are very, in, they're, they're really incredible. You get about two months worth of um, reading and training and everything like that before you actually go and do the trip. And so when we were talking about, you know, you know something that we could bring to local con congregations, we decided, look, why don't we just take all of this training and attempt to boil it down, you know, to one day. Like if we were just going to have, we had one day to train people on what we thought the, you know, the absolute essentials were if we were going to send them out, you know, um, what would we do? And so that's kind of how today and, and what we're going to talk about uh, came together. Um, this is our inaugural trip to uh, Israel, which, uh, you know, Josh and Caitlin were on as well. So all these um, here, uh, I guess a number of these from Washington State, um, came to Israel this past year after training and, and also having gone to Utah, at least on one of the Utah trips, to share the gospel here in Israel with Israelis. And we had some amazing, amazing conversations. Um, here's my family. Uh, my wife, Jessie, and I have been married for 20 years, and we have four children. And um, this is us um, pretty near um, where we live the water in the background there is the Sea of Galilee in, in Israel. So we became Israeli citizens a little over a year ago, and so uh, we've been living there ever since. So a little bit about us and Builders of Israel, and uh, you know, uh, we'll have more conversations uh, uh, you know, as the day goes on. Um, but uh, I'm going to hand it over to Aaron now. So when we talk about apologetics evangelism, uh, we really have to start uh, at the beginning. And I think a lot of people... Um, we, I would argue to you that most of us have a, a misunderstanding, especially in this culture now, about even the nature of truth. So we always start with truth because that's the most fundamental thing that we can talk about. And if we get this wrong, we're going to get everything wrong going uh, forward. Uh, wrong. Oh, I'm sorry. Just push it once. This? Yeah, until it's virtually green. Oh, there we go. Wow. Do you want me to rewind everything I just <laughs> Hi, I'm Aaron. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we would say uh, nature of truth is the, uh, the most fundamental thing that we can talk about because if we get that wrong, we get everything uh, wrong uh, going forward. And we'll talk about this in, in the next couple of sessions, but uh, we would contend that most of our evangelistic conversations were actually talking past each other. Uh, so most of the times, the reasons why evangelical conversations are so terrible is because we're talking past each other, uh, and, and, and we have to have these fundamental um, groundings that we're both on the same level before we can even advance the conversation. So we'll talk about that a little bit more, but um, it has to be the nature of truth. And so when we're talking to, uh, if I'm talking to anybody, and this is religious, non-religious, uh, if we can't, and, and I would even, this would be even be in-house discussions, right? If we have theological discussions, if we can't agree on the nature of truth, there's no point in even advancing the conversation. Uh, and so truth is obviously up for debate. Uh, so supposedly like in our culture today. So one of the things that we always do at our meetings is we want to start off with just a little video. I want you to watch it. And then, you know, we usually would have people kind of break up and discuss into groups. Maybe we can, we can do that um, a little bit here. But um, yeah, I want you to watch this and uh, see how would you respond or, you know, and it's actually, this is, uh, I think this is actually local to this area. Uh, how would you respond? And it really delves into the nature of truth. Are you aware of the debate happening in Washington State around um, the ability to access bathrooms, locker rooms, spas based on gender identity and gender expression? 
I, I think people should be able to have access to the facility. I think uh, bathrooms could and potentially should be gender neutral because there doesn't need to be a classification for differences. I think people definitely should have the ability to go into whichever locker room they want. Uh, I feel like at least public universities should do their best to accommodate for those who do not have a specific uh, gender identity. You know, whether you identify as male or female and whether your sex at birth is matching to that, you should be able to utilize the resources. So if I told you that I was a woman, what would your response be? Good for you. Okay. Like, <laughs> yeah. Nice to meet you. I'll be like, boy, <laughs> really? I don't have a problem with it. I'd ask you how you came to that conclusion. If I told you that I was Chinese, what would your response be? I mean, I might be a little surprised, but I would say, good for you. Like, yeah, be who you are. <laughs> I would maybe think you had some Chinese ancestor. I would ask you how you similarly came to that conclusion and why you came to that conclusion. Um, I would have a lot of questions just because on the outside, I would assume that you're a white man. If I told you that I was seven years old, what would your response be? Um, I wouldn't believe that immediately. Uh, I probably wouldn't believe it, but I mean, I it wouldn't really bother me that much to go out of my way and tell you no, you're wrong. I'd just be like, oh, okay, he wants to say he's seven years old. If you feel seven at heart, then, <laughs> then so be it. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> so if I wanted to enroll in a first grade class, do you think I should be allowed to? Uh, probably not, I guess. I mean, unless you haven't completed first grade up to this point and for some reason you need to do that now. If that's where you feel like mentally you should be, then I feel like there are communities that would accept you for that. I would say so long as you're not hindering society and you're not causing harm to other people, I feel like that should be an okay thing. If I told you I'm six feet, five inches, what would you say? That I would question. Why? <laughs> because you're not. <laughs> no, I don't think you're 6'5". If you truly believed you're 6'5", I don't think it's harmful. I think it's fine if you believe that. It doesn't matter to me if you think you're taller than you are. <laughs> so you'd be willing to tell me I'm wrong? I wouldn't tell you you're wrong. No, but I say that um, I don't think that you are. I feel like that's not my place as like another human to say someone is wrong or to draw lines or boundaries. No, I mean, I wouldn't just go like, oh, you're wrong, you're like, that's wrong to believe in it, because, I mean, again, it doesn't really bother me what you want to think about your height or anything. So, I can be a Chinese woman. You... <laughs> um, sure. But I can't be a six foot five Chinese woman. Yes. If you thoroughly debated me or explained why you felt that you were six foot five, uh, I feel like I would be very open to saying that you're six foot five, or Chinese, or a woman. So, I mean, and again, we're not that that probably a whole nother conversation on you know uh, on on gender and biological sex. But there were some things in there that I thought that it would, are are really important. There was one guy who was asking, you know, how you came to that conclusion. We'll see. We'll talk about that actually uh, next session. But a lot of it was. How do you feel that you are? What do you feel that you are? And the reality, and so the question, if feelings is what determines reality, then there is no objective reality, right? Because people feel different things. And we, I would argue, it's like when you get into this conversation, I know it's like, especially here in Washington, we'll probably get in trouble. There's probably like people listening to us right now are going to get, the police are going to raid the place. But even, even on this discussion, um, it is, it I mean, obviously it's emotional. But we have to have some core fundamental foundation from which we're starting from to even have a conversation, whether it's that, whether it's other moral questions, whether it's um, what we want to talk about today, whether it's religious discussions. And we would say that that core foundation that we have to start with is the nature of truth. And so there's this, you know, like, it, you know, we, if we think about in, in scripture, there's that interesting um, exchange between Jesus and Pilate in, in John 18. Um, and so, you know, uh, Pilate has the, tr the, the, if there's ever one person you want to ask a bunch of questions, so he has them in front of him, right? And he, and he says to him, right, so to Jesus, so you're a king, right? And he says, you say that I'm a king for this purpose I was born. And for this purpose, I've come into the world, right? To trust your feelings, 
This person, I've come to the world to just uh, go trust your heart. No, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And then Pilate said to him, kind of, at least in my, uh, the way that I read that, uh, like the sort of 21st century, you know, Western view, what is truth, right? We decide what is, you know, I decide what is truth. Truth is whatever I feel. And really that's just the result of bad philosophy that has been uh, infiltrating um, culture, but certainly infiltrating the church, you know, over the last, you know, century or so. And so, we have to ask the question first with truth is, do we even care? Right? Do you even care what is true? Because if you don't care what's true, then let's just, what's, we, don't, we don't need to have any of, any of the, the stuff that we're going to talk about going forward is really of no consequence. Let's just go get pizza. Let's hang out. Let's be friends. Because if you don't care what's true and you're not willing to go wherever truth takes you, it does not matter what the evidence is, right? Because you're just going to do whatever you want to do. And so this is why when, when we do evangelism, one of the questions that I end up always asking students, so when, you know, my context again is uh, Utah and Utah um, is the headquarters, we've talked, the headquarters uh, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or many of you would call them Mormons. Now, under their most recent prophet, Russell Nelson, they said, don't call us Mormons anymore, call us the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Why? Because they want to emphasize, and this is more of a recent thing, this is not a historical thing. In fact, many, uh, if you talk to many adult um, Latter-day Saints, uh, they'll say, we were always told we were not Christians, but now they want to, we're Christians. That's their thing. Now we're Christians. We're just like you, right? We're, we're members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So most of my conversation is with them and we'll talk throughout the day. Uh, many of us have this false understanding of Mormonism, but it's a different God, a different Jesus, a different gospel, different view of scriptures, even different view of truth. And so I'll talk to, I'll ask them, I'll say, if by whatever standard you require, whatever standard you require, if you came to believe that the teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint were not true, and I'll say, look, I'm not even saying I can do that. I'm just saying, if it, hypothetically, would you walk away? And most of the students will tell me no. Why? Because for them, it's not about truth. It's not about um, going where the evidence leads. It's about, here's how I've grown up. It's about, this is my culture. It's about, this is, um, this is what my family has believed, you know, historically. But that's not, um, that's not how we determine what is true, right? I mean, I could have been raised in a uh, Satanist, uh, you know, cult or something. It doesn't make it true. But the same question we have to ask ourselves, and this is really important because a lot of times we'll ask um, of those that we're chatting with, you know, whether they're atheists, agnostic, members of different religions, we'll ask them if they would walk away. We're, we want them to walk away. We want them to come to the truth, which we know is the biblical Jesus. But the question for ourselves would be the same thing. If you were convinced by the evidence, again, whatever standard you require, that Christian, biblical Christianity was not true, would you walk away? I'll, I mean, I'll ask, uh, you know, evangelicals that. And most of them will say no. And again, why? Because it's more of a cultural thing. It's more of an emotional thing. It's more of a, um, this is just my, this is my tribe, so to speak. So we're, we have been conditioned to not think about religion in the realm of truth. It's more in the realm of my truth, which we'll talk about here in a second. But that, it couldn't be, the kinds of claims we're making as Christians in all religions are the kinds of claims that are either true for everybody or they're true for nobody. But what they couldn't be is just true for me. And so we'll even ask, you know, if someone says that they wouldn't walk away, no matter what the evidence, then that's fine. But they're, they're, it's an emotional uh, resistance, right? It, 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 it's, it's not a, or they wouldn't come to Christianity even if it was true. It's an emotional resistance, which I would argue is probably much of what we talk about. And if that's the case, I have to understand that because then all the things we're going to talk about the rest of the day, all the evidence, aren't particularly interested to that person because they're not interested in the evidence. They're interested, they, they've got other reasons why they are objecting to it, which is emotional or whatever reasons. So, um, I don't know, does that make sense or anything you want to add? No? Yeah, that's good. Uh, all right, so truth is, so we're going to do this, you know, we'll do this briefly. Um, and this will be the most dense 
uh, stuff that we're probably that we'll talk about today. So um, don't get uh, don't think this is going to be this big you know super philosophy uh, lecture. And again, it's not super dense, but just the th some of the terms we're going to talk about. But I would argue to you if, that that this is probably the most central thing that I have come to understand over the last um, you know ten years uh, being in ministry that has helped me. Uh, it, it shaped the way that I have conversations with everybody evangelistically. And then we'll and we'll show you later today. This is not this is true in our political discussions. This is true in our in-house theological discussions. If we can understand, if we can get truth right, then everything will go from there. If we get truth wrong, then everything goes from there, right? And it usually goes down. So truth, there's lots of different ideas about what truth is. If, we, if you want to kind of go through some of these different theories philosophically, we can happy to do that with you, um, you know, during breaks and stuff. But I would just say truth is just that which corresponds to reality. And it's not very, it's not deep. It's not super, um, Profound, but it, 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 at this point in our culture, we have to start with the most basic building blocks, right? Um, there, truth is that which corresponds to reality. It is true that you're here on the morning of September 30th uh, at you know this church or this facility, listening to us babble for the next, you know for for the day because it actually is true because you actually are here. Uh, I've I've sat with a friend of mine who's a lawyer, and we had this conversation. I said, if someone told you that you weren't here right now, they would be wrong, right? And we had, a, we had about an hour and a half discussion because he would not admit that they were wrong. It goes back to what we're saying. We don't want to tell anybody they're wrong. I said, you're telling me if someone says we weren't having this discussion right now, that they wouldn't be wrong? And he said, well, I mean, that's like their view, their belief. I'm like, of course, that's their view. That's their belief. But their belief would be wrong, right? And he wouldn't admit it. And, you know, this, these are lawyers. So be careful, you know, who you're paying to argue your cases. Or as Aristotle famously said, to say of what is that it is not, or what is it not that it is, is false, while to say of what it is that it is, and of what is not that it is not is true, so that he who says of anything that it is or that it is not will say either what is true or what is false, right? Obviously. Like, <laughs> you ever want to have like that, like stitched on a pillow, like when, you, when you're you like, or like have that, like when people walk in and say, as for me, my house will follow the Lord, like have that on your wall, which shows you like you're a huge nerd. All, all he's saying is, if, if something is true, I want to say it's true. And if something is false, then I have to say it's false. That's why I, I have to do that as a, uh, if, if I want to be thinking well about the most important things. And so here, here are, you know, we talk about truth and here are six truths about truth. So again, this can be, I, I, we don't want this to be dense, but I promise you, if we get this right, everything will, uh, will, will build off that. Okay. So the first off truth is discovered. It's not invented. So, so if something, truth exists independent of anyone's knowledge of it, right? So um, we would say, you know, it, it's, it's, in, it's, some people say, oh, you're just inventing truth. No, we're discovering what is true, right? So gravity was always true. People were, you know, Newton didn't invent gravity. He discovered it, right? People weren't floating around in space. All of a sudden he invented gravity and then there's, oh, now I'm down on the ground. No, he discovered what was true. In the same way, we would say we are trying to discover, in our evangelistic conversations, we are trying to discover what is true about reality and eternal life. We're trying to discover which religion, if any, are true. We're not inventing it. We're not coming up with it on our own. We're trying to figure out which corresponds to reality, right? So number two, truth is transcultural. If something, if something is true, it's true for all people at all times at all places. So people have this idea, well, that's true for you in the Western world, but if you go, if you go to the Eastern world, that's a whole different view uh, of truth, and it's much more experiential. No, like two plus two equals four, whether you're here or in India or on, the, on Mars or wherever, it was true 10,000 years ago. It'll be true 10,000 years into the future. So if, again, if we're trying to find a religion that's true, or truth claims about eternal life, those will be true for everybody across all cultures, across all time, across every, you know, across every um, divide that we can have. Okay, so those are two. Number three, truth is unchanging, even though our beliefs about truth change. So, uh, you know, David and I probably, there's, there's probably been lots of theological positions. I know for me, there's been tons of theological positions that I used to hold when I first started studying this that I don't hold now. That doesn't mean that truth changed. That means that I changed, that my beliefs about truth changed. So, so um, you know, some people think the Earth is flat, right? And, uh, and the, I think Kyrie Irving still believes the Earth is flat. Actually, I was talking to a guy. I was talking to a guy at UVU this past week who is a flat earther. So there are some people, but the, but it, you know, historically, the 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 
idea is, and I don't even know if this is exactly true, that people used to think the earth is flat, then they changed their view, and now they believe the earth is sphere. But it wasn't that truth changed, it was our beliefs about it change. And what this means is you have to hold some of your, most of your truths loosely and let them be examined and challenged, and then the goal is that we seize on what actually is true. But that means that if good evidence comes about that something that I believe is false, I have to have the courage to change because truth is not what's changing. Hopefully, my beliefs about reality is changing corresponding to the evidence, which is why we would give people evidence if they are interested. And we'll talk about that throughout the day. Beliefs cannot change a fact. This is super important, no matter how sincerely held they are. When we are in Utah, when we are in Israel, uh, probably here, I'm sure, in Washington, you will meet people that sincerely hold religious positions that are false. And they are the nicest people you'll meet, and they're very kind, and they're, um, you know, they're, they're just, but they are wrong. And, and you saw in that video, in our culture today, to say people are wrong in what they believe, somehow we've decided that's wrong. Now, obviously the irony is, well, is that wrong? You can't say, you know, how, then it's self-refuting. But I have to be willing to do that, right? Sincerity does not mean something is true. And so like, you know, I always use the example, if I, if I convinced everybody here that I could fly and we all believed it and I got up on the roof of this building and we sincerely all believed I could fly and I jumped off, what's going to happen? I had a guy one time say, you might fly. He's like, no, I wouldn't. I would fall on my face and break my face. Why? Because I'm not going to fly. It's not true, even if we sincerely believe it. And this just means that, if, especially in religious discussions, I have to be willing to recognize. People say, what about all the people in all the different religions across the world? What about it? I mean, and again, we're going to talk about, not in a callous way, none of this is, but just that everyone believes different things, they can't all be true, and no matter how sincerely they hold these beliefs. But then kind of the flip side of that is truth is not affected by the attitude of the one professing it. Sometimes people are jerks and they tell you true things. Like, I have to learn to be able to separate, okay, that guy's a jerk or that lady's a jerk, usually it's guys, right? That guy's a jerk, but what he's saying is true. And so a lot of times, people, you know, what are some people's objections about Christianity? What the Crusades and, you know, all these. Okay, now we could have a whole conversation about what really happened there. But the point is, like, d- the question is, what is true, not are people jerks? Because, again, you can be a, you know, you can be a jerk and say um, true things. You can be the nicest person in the world and say false things. Again, our question is, which, what corresponds to reality? What is true? That is our goal. And then lastly, this is the one that's most controversial on all college campuses, right? If you say that all truths are absolute truths. There is no such thing, there's no such thing as a relative truth. People say all truth is relative. You know what I say to them? Is that absolutely true? <laughs> is it absolutely true that all truth is relative? Because if it's absolutely true that all truth is relative, then that's not a relative truth, which I know Frank Turk says that can give you intellectual constipation, right? So just think about it for a second. And the point is, all truth is absolute truth. There is no such thing as something that's just true for you. Now, you could say, I know something that's relatively true right now, right? Um, you know, pro- Caitlin, are you cold right now? No, no. So usually my wife could be in the Sahara Desert. And she's like, it's a little chilly right here. You know, like, can I have a sweater? You know, so you say, oh, there's a relative truth, right? So for Jess, you know, it's cold. For me, it's warm. No, it's, that's an absolute, those are absolute truths. It's, it's true for all people at all times, at all places, that if we're in the Sahara Desert right now, that Aaron Marshall was warm, and it's true for all people at all times and all places that at the same time and place that Jesslyn Marshall was cold. It's not a, it's not, temperature isn't relative. It's objectively, no, if we have to, if we want to say it's cold, what we would have to figure out? What do we mean when we say it's cold? And that's an objective claim that we can then test and say it's either cold or it's hot, but it's not relative to the person. And so this is where the, the rubber meets the road, and this is where all of this matters. And again, just hang with me because I know this, this is, uh, it can be complex, but it's, if you think about it for a few minutes, it's not only is not complex, it's, it's super important. If all truth is absolute truth, okay, but within absolute truth, I can still make claims that are subjective, okay? If I tell you that Dr. Pepper is delicious, I'm actually trying to be healthier, and so I'm on a, a no-soda kick for, uh, like for the next 70 days, and I used to drink way too many Dr. Peppers, and it's not good for you, right? But if I tell you Dr. Pepper is the best soda, Dr. Pepper is delicious, 
am I, what, am I, am I really telling you about Dr. Pepper? Am I really telling you about the thing? No, what, I'm telling you about my preference, right? Like I'm telling you about what I prefer, what I like. It's true for me, right? It's a personal preference. Now, could I be wrong in what I like? If I told you Dr. Pepper was delicious, could I be wrong in that? Would that be weird if I was like, Dr. Pepper is delicious. Oh, it's gross. Actually, it's delicious. Actually, it's gross. Like if I'm just drinking it, but I did No, that's weird. It seems like personal preferences, those kind of subject, we call these subjective truths, are the kinds of claims that are neither right or wrong. You, you can't be wrong on your preference. I like Virginia Tech athletics. I like Dr. Pepper, right? I, I like to ride motorcycle. These are all just preference claims for me, but I'm not talking about objective reality. And those are the kinds of claims that they're neither right or wrong. And I'll show you why this is really important in a second. Objective claims, again, all of this is absolute truth, but within absolute truth, you've got subjective and objective. Objective truths are the kinds of truths that are true for the object. So if I change the claim and I said this, Dr. Pepper cures diabetes. Would that, that'd be awesome if it did, right? You just chug a bunch of Dr. Pepper and you cure all your you know, diabetes, whatever disease you, you had, you know, just, you know, it, would, it would cure it. But if I change that claim, no longer am I now talking about my personal preference. No longer am I, you know, am I talking about, no longer does it matter what I want to be the case. The question is, what is the case? And if I said Dr. Pepper cures diabetes, how could we figure that out? How could we determine if that was true or not? We would test it. We would look at the evidence and we would determine that that's a false claim, right? So it's not true, even though I want it to be true, even though my preference would be that it's true. So you see, with objective claims, they're either right or wrong, right? Subjective, neither right or wrong. They're just preference claims. Objective claims are either right or wrong. They're either true or false. Now, why? Does this matter besides just this weird diatribe about Dr. Pepper? Because Christianity and all religions are making objective truth claims about reality that are either true or false for all people at all times and all places. It is either true objectively that God exists or he doesn't. It is either true objectively that we can trust the Bible because the Bible's been correctly transmitted or it hasn't. It is either objectively true that Jesus rose from the dead or he didn't. These are the kinds of claims that are either objectively true about reality or they're not. Most of us, and again, culturally, most of us as Christians, and I would argue most of us when we think about religion, we treat religious claims as subjective. We treat religious claims as if we're talking about our favorite flavor of ice cream or soda or whatever. And so we would say, for me, think about as Christians, you maybe done, for me, Christianity is true. You know, my God, you know, and again, we want to be careful of the language. For me, Christianity is true. Well, my God says this. No, it's true that, yes, God is our God. But it's not for me. It is for me, but it's either for me and for everybody, it's for, or it's for no one. And so what we have to do as believers is we have to stop relativizing our faith. We have to start saying, the, kinds of claim, the kind of claim I'm making is the kind of claim that's either true for everyone or it's true for no one. But what it could never be is just true for me. I mean, think, it, it, the kind of claims we're making, Jesus rose from the dead, that's either a true claim about history or it isn't, right? The, the, the evidence for, like the, the apostles in the Bible, did they do what they said they did? Um, again, can we trust the transmission of the text? These are claims that are either true for everyone or they're true for no one. And what we've done is we've relativized our faith by making it subjective, as it is just our personal preference. So the most important thing that we can help people understand at the beginning of these conversations is the kind of claim that we're making when we say Christianity is true. We are saying it either is, that we're saying that's objectively true for all people at all times and all places. And people say, well, what about all the other religions? What about all the other religions? Can all religious beliefs be true? So this is actually uh, uh, someone we, we've studied under, um, he actually went to the same seminary that I went to, Frank Turek. He wrote a book called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. We recommend that book. Um, super helpful. We've studied at his cross-examined Instructors Academy. And this is something that, you know, kind of he came up with called the Roadrunner Tactic, where he just, you want to, uh, whenever someone makes a claim, we want to apply it against itself. So if someone says all religious beliefs are true, what if my religious belief is that not all religious beliefs are true? Is, is that true? Right? The problem with saying all religious beliefs are true is that every religious belief 
contradicts each other. So Christianity, Islam, Mormonism, uh, Judaism, um, you know, you, you, any religion, we're going to have differences, core differences on the most important things, on the essentials, where we're saying different things. I mean, people say, you know, all religions basically teach the same thing. Okay, yeah, they basically teach the same thing except for the nature of God, the nature of man, sin, salvation, heaven, hell, creation. I mean, literally everything that matters. They teach different things. Now, that doesn't make what we're saying right just because they're different, but what it does mean is that when we look at two contradicting, two religions, they both can't be right. Here's an example. Islam teaches that Jesus did not die on the cross. It could not be the case that he both died on the cross and did not die on the cross. If he did not, did not die on the cross, obviously he didn't rise from the dead in the way that biblical Christianity says he did. So that, that's either true or it's false. But in these core doctrines, we're teaching very different things. Both religions cannot be true. And so that's why we have to, if, but, but if we're on the same page on that, if we talk to somebody and they're like, yes, we agree with you, they all can't be true. We agree with you that, that uh, there is objective truth. We agree with you that we want to believe whatever is true. And if the evidence points to us, then we'll go, then we'll go wherever that is. Those are the kind of people we want to rock with. Those are the kind of people that we want to, now we can have the conversations. And so that's why this is so fundamental. We have to ask those, those uh, questions at the beginning of our evangelistic conversations, because if they're not ready to go there, or they want to say truth is relative, or they want to get to this, I mean, if, especially on college campuses, you know, you talk with the guy who says there is no truth, and how do we know we're not in the matrix, and all, that's fine, and that's an interesting philosophical discussion, but most likely, those are the people you just want to, you know, we want to get pizza with, we want to say thanks for talking to us, right? Those are probably not the people, and we'll talk about um, in our categories in, a, in, in the next session, two sessions, um, those are probably not the people that we want to spend a lot of our time trying to evangelize with, because they've told you they don't really care about truth. But if they do care, and they're ready to have that conversation, then we can, then we can proceed. And just one last thing, and then, you know, I'm, David, if you have any comments or anything, um, this is for us in Utah. Um, every time we talk to the LDS, so the Latter Day Saint, the, the Latter Day Saints um, in the Book of Mormon, it tells them how do you know um, how do you know if the Book of Mormon is true, and it tells you um, in Moroni ten, it tells you to read the Book of Mormon and then pray about it. And then you'll have this subjective personal experience, this quote burning in your bosom, and that will confirm to you that what you believe is true. And so it's heartbreaking because we will talk to Latter-day Saints every day, and they will tell us, you're telling me that my personal experience is false because my religion is false. And I'm saying, no, I'm not saying that. I don't know. So A, I, don't, I think there's, I think, and this is maybe a separate conversation, I think that um, especially within the, with the LDS world, they are having real spiritual experiences. The question is, are they good spirits or bad spirits, right? I think that's, um, but secondly, we're all having spiritual experiences, right? My, my uh, LDS friends have spiritual experiences. We have spiritual experiences. My Muslim friends have spiritual experiences. Um, you know, you can go to CrossFit and have spiritual experiences, right? That doesn't mean it's the one true religion. And so what we have to do, I would, just, I would say that's one of the worst ways to try, try to determine if a religion is true. And yet many evangelicals have bought into that idea, and the reason why they know it's true is because your spiritual experience. Now, here, please hear me this. I'm not denigrating your spiritual experience. I'm not saying that's wrong in any way. What I'm saying, and I think if you're, if you're a believer in the biblical Jesus, your spiritual experience is real in the sense of that, that's confirming that that's true. But what I'm saying is you have to have some kind of evidence. You have to have something that tethers your experience to reality that you can test to make sure that you're not just, it's not just, you know, indigestion, right? That it's not just some uh, spiritual experience, maybe from, a, maybe from a false spirit. I mean, we're, we're told to test the spirits in the scriptures. And so this is where the evidence in the nature of truth comes in. And this is where we would want to try to challenge people to get away from their subjective personal experience if they're trying to determine what religion is true and go towards the objective evidence. And this is where I think, so again, um, lastly, uh, Francis Schaeffer, uh, you know, I, I, I like some of Schaeffer, lots of stuff I disagree with Schaeffer, right? We'll talk about that during the day. Like we have to learn how to do that. Like we, dis we, we don't have to agree with everybody on everything. Uh, but he wrote this great position paper that we have kind of made the... The, 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 the foundation of our ministry. And, and he says, you know, what, what you have, like for a, for a, um, a thoroughgoing, a, a, well, a well thought out biblical uh, ministry, they have to have four things. Sound doctrine, 
and honest answers to honest questions. And a lot of uh, churches, ministries fall off the horse, you know, so to speak, where they just, we don't care about truth. We don't care about it. We're just going to love people. But no, you have to have sound doctrine, right? I mean, the Christian religion is made up of propositional truth claims that if they're not true, what we're believing is false. What we're doing this morning is false, right? I mean, Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians 15. If, if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, we're of all people most pitied. We're wasting our time. So we have to have sound doctrine, and within that, and that's why good biblical teaching. So, you know, just like, you know, this is what Dane and David, and like they're just teaching really good sound, good theology, and thinking well about the most important things is so important. And then having a place where you can have uh, a honest dialogue, where you can actually ask people questions, and they don't just tell you, just have faith. I mean, pa any pastor that tells you, just have faith, if he asked a question, they should be sued for spiritual malpractice, right? I mean, we have to be able to, we want to, not that you have to have all the answers. It's, say, I don't know. One of the things we'll teach when we're doing evangelism, can you say, I don't know? Great, you can evangelize. People think, the number one reason people don't evangelize is because they think they have to have the answers to all the questions. So we want to have, but we, we want to be able to, re, we want to honor them by fight. Let me, that's a good question. Let me figure out the answer and I'll come back and let, I'll think about that. So sound doctrine and, and honest answers, honest questions. Yes, but also true spirituality. And for Schaefer, that was just this lived love affair with Jesus. So it's not just propositional truth claims. It's do I love Jesus? Do I, do, you know, do I have that experience with Jesus that's grounded in reality? But then also, and this is the, the beauty of human relationships, that seeing people that are made in God's image, that are I image bearers of God, that we would say are in spiritual captivity. When I talk to somebody who is in a different religion, especially I would, you know, when I, when I have my conversations with, with Mormons, uh, we would say that they're spiritual prisoners of war. And so I don't go and yell at them. I don't just stand and, you know, with a sign and just scream at them on a corner. These are people to be loved. And if you don't love people, don't do evangelism. Because there's plenty of people that are just yelling propositional truth claims at people. But that's not the heart of Jesus, right? So it is, it, it is necessary. We, we talk about philosophical, necessary and sufficient. It's necessary to have these pro the right propositional truths that we believe in. That's why the nature of truth is so important. But there's something more than that, right? It's this lived love affair with Jesus. And we, if we fall off the horde, if, if we just get, and this is where so many critiques of apologists rightly come in, where we just want to beat people over the head with truth, but we're not introducing them to the love of Jesus. So I, want, I mean, as we talk today, we want you to hear truth, it, we would say is foundational and so important, but we're also not just beating people up with truth. We're trying to introduce them to Jesus. And we'll talk about this in the next session. When we have these conversations, we always say, you know, if, if they get angry, we lose. If we get angry, we lose. Because we're not just trying to win an argument, right? We're trying to win someone to Jesus. So, I don't know, other thoughts or disagreements? Usually he just disagrees with much of what I have to say, but I got he's 30 very minutes kind. of disagreement, yeah. 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 No, I think um, it's always easy to take this and say, okay, what is it about everyone else? It's a belief system that is not true. But I think the first thing that you have to do is analyze what you believe. And I'm constantly trying to analyze, okay, is what I believe true? Because if we are not believing things that are true and living uh, in a way that is true, then we're not living in a world that's real. I want to live in reality. And by living in reality, then I can worship God the best. I can know the most about him because he is the ultimate reality. And so again, all the things that we're going through today, these seven sessions, every single one, I like to turn on myself first and say, okay, what is it about this specific subject that I could better think better about? Like, and I can think better in my own thought life. I can maybe, you know, there's these things over here that I believe and I'm not sure on, you know, I'm going to study these more so that I can have a more true understanding of what reality is. So again, just first and foremost, we want to look inwardly and say, how can we best transform our own lives with truth and then we're much better uh we're much better equipped to go and actually talk to other people and it also really humbles you because when you go out and you talk to people you realize really quickly you don't know as much as you thought you knew um you also find out that they don't you know they don't know as much as you thought that they might know uh so we're gonna take a five minute break here and then we'll be right back um so we got a little start a little bit late we should have you know 10 15 minutes at the end of these but um yeah we'll be back in five minutes and we'll get we'll start going again